is Mark Ludwig from the Allegan Conservation District. This is the narrated version of my talk on soil health called Vertical Expansion, where we're going to talk about expanding the root zone in order to increase your profitability and reduce the costs of farming. I call this the affordable expansion because instead of going out and trying to acquire more land in order to improve our productivity, we're going to deepen the root zone. Uh, we're going to do that with steady investment rather than going out to borrow more money. And in addition to having a good potential for yields, we're going to have a good potential to control costs. We're going to eliminate a number of practices that are common on the farm. And I'll just be very upfront. I'm a, a big advocate for no-till, for conservation tillage, and for getting away from the tillage. I think it's the number one thing we can do to improve uh, both the environmental outcomes on the farm and, frankly, the profitability of the farm. Uh, and really we're at a golden age in crop production uh, between genetics, not only GMOs, but marker-assisted breeding where we're breeding crops based on the, the, uh, our knowledge of the genome of the crop. Uh, we're making tremendous genetic progress very quickly. The equipment is really outstanding these days. Uh, a lot of folks who maybe tried no-till in the past I think we'll be pleasantly surprised by what's available out there. Certainly Precision Ag is supporting all of this and the ability to, for example, use RTK to really precisely line up where we're going to travel through fields is, is just great stuff. Uh, remote sensing is giving us more data than ever before. Um, certainly I think our, our modern tractors are, and equipment are very comfortable and safer than when we were in open station machines. And the internet is, of course, just full of all kinds of uh, information uh, from all over the world on how to get it done. And really, I think we can we can say uh, we've got a tremendous potential for conservation and good yields at the same time. I encourage you to set your yield targets high. Um, 300 bushels of corn, 100 bushels of soy. I used to talk about 100 bushels of wheat, but then I heard Phil Needham talk at the National No-Till Conference. I think we can up that to that uh, 200 bushel range, which certainly would make wheat a whole lot more profitable and attractive. Why do we need these high yield targets? Well, we've got 9 billion people by the middle of the century. We've got the demands that biofuels and other industrial uh, uses of our crops are taking. Uh, high global grain price all over the world and we've seen some really massive crop failures uh, the last few years. Uh, think about when the basically the whole Eastern European wheat crop burned up. Uh, think about our own experience with the 2012 drought. So we, we certainly are seeing uh, issues are around the world of crop failure which require us to to really think about producing more when we have those good years. Uh, certainly also uh, water is going to be huge in the next century. We're already seeing the western aquifers under the Dakotas all the way down into Texas really starting to drop and, and the wells there not yielding what they used to. Certainly here in Michigan we're in a good position to, to utilize our tremendous water resources to our advantage in agriculture. What do we mean by soil health? Uh, we certainly want to see good porosity, you know, 50% mineral soil, about 25% air, 25% water, somewhere in the neighborhood of 3 to 5% uh, organic matter. High populations of soil life to deal with the, especially the tremendous corn residue and wheat residue that we produce these days. And that soil life is going to give us a natural nitrogen reserve and rapidly decompose residue so we won't, won't uh, have those residue challenges once we've got that soil stabilized nearly as much as we do when that soil isn't healthy. Uh, high organic matter, I think we all know the, the advantages of that, better water and nutrient holding capacity, balanced nutrients, and I, I really hit on balance. Not only do we not want to see any deficiencies in the soil, but we don't want to see vast excesses. And if we do have those, those high excesses, especially of phosphorus, we need to think about what we're going to do about that to make sure our crops are getting what they need. Uh, I encourage you to not only look at the macronutrients, M, P, and K, your secondaries, calcium, magnesium, uh, but also the micronutrients, that's sulfur, that's the other secondary. Um, a lot of people are not testing for micronutrients, and especially where you know, we're starting to see issues where Roundup is tying up some of these micronutrients in large amounts. We've really got to start thinking about those micronutrients. pH, I think we all know, is, is important to control. We don't want to get that up too high. We certainly don't want to see it too low. Uh, and let's address those excesses, like I said. If the phosphorus is high, we're going to have to think about adding some zinc and 
and some iron down the row, maybe in our starter fertilizers to make sure we're getting those, those things in there. So pop-ups, seed treatments, all good ideas to deal with those, those issues. What we're really looking for is a soil that's kind of like chocolate cake. It's moist, it's sticky, it's darker in color because of the high carbon, high in sugars because of all the life that's going on in there. So we're going to have good yields and tough conditions and great yields when we have a good year. I know most of you are probably familiar with this, but a few things to just point out about the old soil texture triangle. You can really see that it does not take a whole lot of clay on a percentage basis to really make that soil a, a clay dominated soil. Um, you know, I, I kind of joke that uh, here in Michigan we've got three kinds of soil. We've got too much sand, too much clay, and too much water. Um, certainly, uh, when we're starting to think about a transition to no-till, those heavier clay soils are going to be a little more difficult to work with. And a lot of this talk today is going to be about how to make that clay soil uh, perform properly under a no-till or reduced lich system. The big one in clay, of course, is pore space. You know, sand has plenty of pore space. That's why we, you know, we can pour a bucket of water on sandy ground in a few minutes; it'll be gone. Um, and making uh, pores in clay is challenging. I'm, I'm not going to uh, deny that for a second. But I think we, we all too often think that what we've got to do out there is get out our chisel plow and we're going to fluff that soil up. And I, I think in the we, we have kind of a counterintuitive situation. Less tillage over time is going to give you more porosity, more ability for that soil to uh, get good air flow through it, more ability for water to pass through it. We're going to talk a lot about that today. How do we get those pores by not tilling? Well, worms are a big one, of course, the, especially our big uh, night crawlers. They make uh, wonderful macro pores in there. Uh, freeze thaw has a, a modest effect, especially on uh, on the shallow level that will help open up the soils if we get that soil frozen and thawed a couple of times through the years. Cation effects I think are important and one we, we sometimes miss. Keeping especially uh, our calcium uh, fairly high in these clay soils can really help. We'll show you a slide on that in a minute. Organic matter helps quite a lot too if we can get that organic matter up that kind of will complex with that clay and, and improve the crumb structure. What we're really doing over time is we're going to substitute those short-term tillage pores that we make by fluffing it up and aggressively tilling with a long-term no-till pore structure. Um, and sometimes I think you know we're going out there to comply with our manure gaps where we're, we're trying to break macro pores to keep uh, manure from leaking out tiles, for example. And I think these are, are somewhat counterproductive. You know, We're so worried about a little bit of flow via tiles that we are we're essentially going out there and regularly destroying our pore structure where and I think that's leading to more erosion uh, and maybe higher actual losses of phosphorus and other nutrients to the the environment so I certainly well I'm not gonna say that that we want to see manure leaking off the farms uh, I, I sometimes think that our, our worries about those issues may be causing us some trouble and I'll have some suggestions as we go forward how we might deal with that we all know that organic matter is great stuff. Uh, it really will make just about any soil better. It's critical for nutrient cycling and very helpful for nitrogen retention. And it's going to increase our cation exchange capacity and water holding capacity, especially in sand, just critical in sand. It's also going to improve pore structure and tilth and clay, and really tracking it over time is a good indicator of whether we're heading in a positive direction soil health-wise or maybe whether we're declining. If we can gain a tenth of a percent of organic matter per year, more or less, that's pretty good. Uh, and that's what we're, what kind of the benchmark I'd like you to think about. Keep in mind, too, there's a lot of different forms of organic matter, everything from, you know, uh, the bits of plants laying on the surface to these more developed humic and fulvic acids over time. And, and basically, the more this stuff breaks down, the more kind of functional it becomes uh, from a soil structure point of view. Um, so we want to think about being carbon farmers. We want to see that carbon level rising in the soil over time. You know, I like to ask uh, farmers, you know, are, how many of you are livestock farmers? And I like this question because my answer is you're all livestock farmers. The soil microbes, the insects, the earthworms in your field need care and feeding just like other livestock. If we abuse them, 
they will die and they will not be there to provide the the services we need them to do uh, keep in mind they are made uh, uh, up of carbon nitrogen phosphorus sulfur uh, and if we're building populations of soil life they're going to eat first before your crop uh, you know they are really dominant in the soil uh, much more so than crop roots are so as we are building up those populations we may have to adjust our fertility program to compensate for that our management choices are going to have a huge effect on their well-being tillage certainly is number one uh, residue coverage is very helpful for building soil life It keeps the soil cooler so we're not burning up those critters in the spring and cover crops are huge a living plant actually pumps sugars and other chemicals down into the soil to feed the soil life so every day we have a green growing crop on on the surface we are feeding our soil life every day that's missing we're starving them and they have some ability to hang on you know, they, can, they can do some things in the off season you know when it's cooler to to maintain themselves but really if there's a green growing plant there that's much better um, and there's other effects certainly soil texture chemistry drainage will all have effects you know if we if we allow a soil to become flooded for example that will radically change the profile of the soil life this is just a quick uh, kind of schematic diagram of, of where uh, there's different food flows through the soil food web obviously not all of these critters are something we're thrilled about the slugs the snails you know that's not necessarily something we want to see in our fields however most of the soil life the vast majority of it is beneficial uh, for your farm and the more of it we've got basically the better we're off we're going to be uh, I'm going to hit just a few of the uh, uh, classes of uh, soil life and you know there is there's a wealth of information out there and certainly all of them are important to understand uh, fungi though are, are particularly important for a couple of reasons first is the breakdown of residues the lingon component which is where most of our stalk strength comes from in our grain crops is basically not able to be broken down by anything but fungi they are able to take the uh, take those components apart and break them down uh, over time um, so they're having those fungi that population of fungi is critical and one of the things that happens when we till is we are favoring bacteria over fungi uh, the the rush of air and the stirring of the soil will break the the hyphae or the roots that fungi form and really favor a, a burst of population for bacteria so if we're going in and we're tilling multiple times through the season we're really setting back the fungi mycorrhizae fungi are particularly interesting they will actually either colonize the outsides of roots or in some cases actually grow right into them you can kind of see this on the uh, picture here they'll either colonize the outside or they'll actually grow right into the structure of the root itself uh, mycorrhizal fungi are are dozens of times more efficient at bringing nutrients and water into the plant roots as the plant roots are themselves um, so when we're when we're able to rapidly colonize our our crop plants with these mycorrhizal fungi that's just that much quicker they're going to get started in in, in the spring um, being able to, to draw in those nutrients the other thing we get uh, with good fungi we actually get some mechanical support and resilience to the soil uh, and of course the rapid residue consumption uh, earthworms similarly are, are really interesting critters and really important to the success of a good no-till soil they thrive in high residue situations um, you know a lot of our no-tillers that have been at it for a long time uh, we'll talk about how they're, as their worm populations have risen they actually see the residue rapidly consumed the earthworm the uh, night crawlers will actually drag residue right down into the into their burrows you can kind of see a night crawler burrow here they really are not only a conduit for nutrients being pulled down in there but it's also a way for large amounts of water to rapidly infiltrate so really just great things to have in your soil I've seen pictures of actually uh, uh, corn leaves dragged into the bur into these burrows well they're still attached to the corn plants it's kind of a kind of a nifty picture um, 
We have three major groups of earthworms. Well, we talked a little bit about the night crawlers already. They're kind of uh, pulling things right down underneath the soil. We have a surface dwelling class. We would call them red wigglers uh, in, in the fishing trade. They're kind of uh, shallowly under the residues. Uh, and we also have more of a uh, soil dweller. They're, they're moving more horizontally in the soil and kind of reprocessing the soil underground for their nutrition. All of them are good for our soils. All of them help liberate nutrients and all of them help manage our, uh, our residues. You know, I like to say soil life isn't free, but it's cheap. Um, they are easily the least expensive employees you have. Uh, you know, nobody's got to provide them with insurance. Nobody's got to provide them with, with a salary. Really, all we've got to do is feed them to breed them. Uh, keeping in mind that they eat first, we're going to have to do some things in those first few years as we're building up those populations. We've got about a three to five year period where we're going to build to a stable microbial population. And some of the nutrients we're applying to that time you can think of as entering into a savings account. Uh, they may be tied up in the short run, but because they're incorporated into a living creature, which is not want, want to be... Um, uh, displaced out of the soil, those nutrients are, are, are held fairly tightly. The nice thing is though they, they through the season will be eating each other and because of the different ratios of nitrogen to carbon between the different classes of microbes as they eat each other they're going to release a steady amount of nitrogen and the nice thing is that nitrogen is available later in the season when we really need it for grain fill as opposed to trying to put it on up front like we we so often do or you know go to fairly extreme measures to feed those uh, feed that uh, nitrogen late in the season we can take a uh, nitrogen credit of about 20 pounds of N per percent of organic matter and figure that that's pretty good. Uh, the other thing to consider is what your residue is really worth. You know, we've been talking in this country for about the last 10 years about how uh, three years from now there's going to be this cellulosic ethanol. And as far as I'm concerned, that, that uh, can stay three years out forever. If we really started taking all the corn stalks off the fields, uh, we would really have to start thinking about ways to replace the function of that residue, such as cover cropping, and replace those nutrients. For sure, if you're going to sell that residue, you ought to know what the, the fertilizer value and what the carbon value of that residue is and make sure you're getting paid enough for it. So what we're talking about with vertical expansion really in a lot of ways is building soil life and staying away from the things that are, are detrimental to soil life. We've got to feed them, uh, crop residues, manures, with the cover crops, a diverse rotation is helpful. And if you can't, you know, if you're just a pure cash cropper or you're in the livestock business, you don't want to grow anything but corn and soybeans, diversify your rotation with cover crops. Um, try to keep something green on the soil life and remember that as you build up more soil life it needs more feed you know once you've built up this high population of soil life that doesn't mean we can quit it means we we've, we've got more livestock out there more livestock mean we need more feed so that the, the use of the cover crops leaving that residue in a proper place that becomes more important low disturbance of the soil we talked I talked a little bit already about the about uh, disturbing the balance of, of bacteria to fungi. You know, whenever we're out there tilling, we're breaking fungal hyphae, we're throwing that balance off, we're killing earthworms and other life. Um, some farms are not ready to go pure no-till. I certainly understand there are some challenges that may require you to, to stay with more of a conservation tillage model. You know, and I, I define conservation tillage pretty broadly. If you're working in the top two to three inches and you're not going down into that deeper root zone, in a lot of ways you're getting many of the same benefits as a true continuous no-till system. Uh, we want to think more about residue management instead of burying it. I think vertical tillage is extremely promising. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been very impressed with many of these implements, though, you know, uh, of course, sometimes our vertical tillage tools are... are are more uh, I, I think sometimes everything gets labeled vertical tillage these days just because it's a new new thing but you know uh, a properly used vertical tillage tool even a light disking is okay uh, 
one of my mentors used to use a rotavator, tractor mounted rototiller, but again, he's only going a few inches deep. And, you know, we've been talking about this for a lot of years. Plowman's Folly, uh, put, put out in 1943, still a very interesting book to read. And, you know, they, they, he was kind of onto this concept way back then. So here's my rule of thumb. If the dirt's flying, the critters are dying. And you need to ask yourself if, if that uh, tillage pass that you're making really has a purpose because it definitely has a downside. Uh, I think manure is sometimes cited as a big barrier. We talked a little bit about uh, how the GAMPs may be counterproductive. There certainly is a no-till exception in the GAMPs. You know, it basically says if you're running a no-till system, if you're running a continuous pasture, you can apply manure without incorporation. Um, I think some of our tile flow issues, we might look at drainage water management structures, and you can see that these on the bottom here as a way to deal with the the issue of flow via via tiles by instead of breaking the soil structure up and breaking the macro pores instead putting a control structure on the tiles so we can block them up when we're when we're not uh, wanting flow to occur and and simply give the soil time enough to absorb the manure rather than worrying about about breaking those macro pores uh, certainly there are other ways to handle overland runoff, uh, you know, buffers, and really good structure makes a huge difference. You know, the difference between a, a heavy soil with poor structure uh, versus one that's good might be as much as two inches of rain before there's overland flow. Um, so I think a good structure would go a long way to help us uh, deal with some of these issues. I think solid separation is very uh, attractive as well. Could we, for example, uh, separate solids, irrigate the liquid fraction out through uh, center pivots or even via subsurface irrigation uh, and, and get those, those high nitrogen liquids out on the, on the ground during the growing season when plants can rapidly take them up and maybe apply solids uh, only specific times of the year is when, when the uh, runoff potential would be low. Uh, certainly other ways to do drainage management, uh, we ran into this firm called Agram that designs uh, uh, tile drainage systems on the contour, as you can see in the picture above. By putting them on the contour, it really enhances the ability of not only to do uh, tile water management, but also to sub-irrigate. And in fact, they even talk about uh, using solid separation and then sub-irrigating manure which you know uh, takes care of the odor issue takes care of the runoff issue it's just got a lot to to um, recommend it as far as nutrient management certainly uh, you don't want to see over application of nitrogen that can be detrimental to uh, the buildup of organic matter over time though as we as I've, I've been saying during the no-till transition you may need to apply a little more nitrogen just to deal with the the building up the soil life populations. I'm a big fan of the variable rate technology for lime and nitrogen and other materials and especially sensor-based nitrogen management. Uh, everything from uh, an app for your iPhone to uh, side dress sensors such as a green seeker or Optrix where we're actually reading the color of the plant and applying nitrogen to to uh, deal with any deficiencies. The nice thing about these during a no-till transition is you're actually going to feed the plant what it's what it really needs instead of guessing. Um, I think cation balance, uh, uh, balancing of the base saturations is very helpful. Um, somewhere between 65-70 percent on uh, calcium on sand up to 20 percent magnesium. I'll explain why a higher magnesium on sand in a second here and up to 5 percent potassium. On clay, we want to be more toward almost 80% uh, calcium, 75-80%, something like that. Uh, lower magnesium, and what this is going to do is help uh, with micropore development. Uh, gypsum is an excellent source for calcium, and it also gets you some sulfur. And if you're going to do this correction, you may be able to give yourself a little uh, credit for displaced potassium and magnesium if those are things uh, that your particular crop needs only recommend dolomitic line when you know magnesium is needed. Um, what that calcium is going to do, it's going to draw clay together and it's going to only bond a certain amount of water to the clay particles. Each calcium, uh, calcium 2 ion is going to hold about two molecules of water where magnesium 2 can hold up to 22 uh, uh, 
uh, molecules of water and how you're going to experience that as a farmer is as uh, a greasy soil versus a soil that's going to drain more quickly. Um, the dispersed situation, the water, uh, can help form surface crusts uh, and just plain hard soil. You know, the I guess what I'll say about this is it is a somewhat controversial uh, notion still to this day. However, it, every year there seems to be more and more information on how this calcium uh, ratio thing seems to have something to it. So I guess I'll just leave that at that. Other things to think about, uh, I think salt index is still something to think about. Other harsh chemistries such as anhydrous ammonia, uh, DAP, chlorides, all of these can be detrimental to soil life. Um, now a healthy soil can resist some of these issues, but it, it certainly is something to think about when we're applying uh, large amounts of these materials. I like to see a balance of highly soluble and less soluble forms of nitrogen, whether that's a, a coated prill of urea, uh, an end stabilizer of some kind, or just using something like uh, um, uh, ammonium sulfate, which is a little slower release, a little less, uh, a little more resistant to uh, being lost through leaching. Um, and certainly placement and, and how we're going to put down these, these materials is important. Uh, stream vars versus spraying um, the spray nozzles if we're spraying uh, uh, nitrogen on wheat in the spring. Uh, variable rate, uh, using sensors, and even using things like electromagnetic conductivity. You may know that as the Varus system uh, can help us identify and correct uh, the whole field very accurately and very, uh, and very precisely. Um, if you're going to apply trace minerals, uh, think about the difference between an oxide, which is not very soluble, versus a sulfate trace minerals. I always recommend sulfates. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a few radical ideas we can start kicking around when we're talking about $8,000 an acre land. Can we add a little bit of clay to sand? Remember, it really doesn't take much clay to change uh, the, the character of a soil. Uh, and our friends at Michigan State are now uh, using a system where they insert a polyethylene membrane below the soil. That's what these little uh, blue scoops are here. The dots are a, a uh, drip irrigation. And in this way we can keep water from leaching rapidly through these sandy soils while still allowing it to pass through these little gaps if we've got a, a real heavy rain. The other thing to think about when balancing the nutrients is we may be able to make a, a better quality feed. Uh, we may be able to have a good, better disease resistance by paying attention to some of our trace minerals, especially copper, zinc, uh, these things. Uh, having sufficient sulfur guarantees that our plants have the chance to make sulfur-bearing amino acids or that the rumen microflora and cattle, for example, can take advantage of that sulfur to make some of these. And these sulfur-bearing amino acids can be very expensive to add if, if they're not present in our grains. Um, I like to see sufficient calcium in, in these feeds as well. Certainly makes a huge difference in forages. Um, and, uh, sufficient magnesium, of course, is still important, on, um, especially in forages, especially in fresh forages. We still do see occasionally grass tetany if we're if the magnesium is way down. That's one of the reasons we, you know, especially on a sandy soil, may be important to have a little more magnesium than on a clay soil. Uh, I do think testing feed is important, especially for some of our dairy guys. You know, they you really need to pay attention to what you've got. Um, and it's certainly nice to know if you did manage to get those minerals into the into your forages so you can adjust your mineral mix accordingly, maybe save a few dollars there. You know, there's other things to think about. What effect does variety have? Uh, should we be thinking about that, especially as we begin to understand the crop genome better? And how do we feed those real top performing varieties for quality in addition to quantity? Um, the fellow in the picture here is Gary Zimmer. He's one of my great mentors in all of this. Uh, and and certainly a great one to read, especially if you're feeding livestock, to think about this whole concept of feeding the soil, to feed the plant, to feed the animals, to feed all of us. And certainly if you're an organic or thinking about organic uh, at all, I can strongly recommend these two books to really get a grip on what uh, soil management has got to be for organic because you are giving up a whole lot of tools in the toolbox when you go organic. Um, compaction management, again, absolutely critical on clay soils. And number one is staying off it when it's wet. 
the number one tool to add to your arsenal um, if you are if you're a farmer with a temptation to get out on wet soils is a fishing boat get off the wet soils stay in the boat as long as you can stand it in the spring if it's too wet and 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 just just stay off it still works great after all these years much cheaper than all the other solutions um, I think we could plant later in many cases I know some of you may have great big farms where you've got a lot of acres to get over and maybe you, you, you can't wait as long as you'd like to but you know how much growth do we really get in April out of out of corn if it's laying there and it's cold and it's wet I, I would contend not very much and that corn planted a little later into proper conditions is going to have less compaction to deal with it's going to come on stronger it's not going to lay there and get beat up by soil diseases and insects as much I think it'll catch uh, some of this early planted corn easily uh, I think GPS controlled traction is a, a great idea if you can get everything to line up on the field so you're driving on those same tram lines every time at least you know where that compaction is and you know where you've got to concentrate your efforts um, Certainly, especially with RTK guidance, where we can get that down under an inch of accuracy, works great. Uh, certainly, there are other ways to do it. Uh, I've seen uh, folks uh, use a little shovel on the planter to groove the field, so you've got a, a place you can drop a uh, front tire on the tractor for your subsequent operations. Uh, check rows and tram lines, all good low-tech ways to achieve these same things. I think tracks are are helpful many times, although you know sometimes when we start talking about these great big grain carts, I think or uh, great big uh, slurry tanks, we may uh, ask too much of the tracks, and certainly uh, got to be careful turning on our end rows that we're not making a hash of uh, the end rows as we turn too tight. Another thing to think about just is tire pressure. Um, the tire pressure for going down the road versus the field can make a huge difference in the amount of compaction. Um, one of the things we're starting to see is maybe being able to adjust tire pressure right from the cab. Uh, certainly might be something to ask about if you're looking for a new tractor. So when we're out there with our heavy metal, uh, grain carts, combines, slurry tanks, um, I really think people ought to be thinking about where to keep those things. The grain cart is is the newest heavy dude on the farm, and if we can keep those things on the end rows, on the roads, um, away from from the fields itself, as opposed to charging across the field with those things to keep up with the combine, I think we're ahead there. And certainly in a wet year, you know, maybe it's time to pull some of those little gravity boxes out of the weeds and not take that giant monster into the field. Uh, combines easily the second heaviest machine we've got out there and you know we've been adding bigger and bigger heads in order to to uh, cover more ground a couple of problems with that obviously the weight is a big one of it you know we might be able to minimize that with uh, aluminum heads or you know some other things um, but are we effectively and evenly spreading that residue with a 40 foot head um, talk about that in a second here and certainly with manure spreading um, I'm a big fan of the drag line versus a tank you know and you know maybe on your farm you you don't want to make those investments uh, to switch over to a drag line system there are a lot of custom applicators out there and in certain corners of our state might be worthwhile to contract with them and focus on some other things with your farm rather than uh, than drag lining manure. They are a little tricky to operate, so it certainly might be something to think about. And I talked a little bit about separating and irrigating a uh, fraction of it. I, I really think that's got a lot of potential that uh, center pivot does not cause much compaction outside of the tire tracks. Other subsoil management issues to think about, you know, do we want to go in there and mechanically subsoil? You know, if we have a lot of compaction, Certainly not a practice I'm opposed to per se. However, um, you know, let's think about something that's going to get down there and do the deep fracturing and the lifting, not mixing the profile, not destroying the residue, and let's only get out there when that profile is dry. Uh, I really think this is a technology best applied after wheat, 
when the soils are typically dry at midsummer, not something to be thinking about in the fall when it's wet or in the spring when it's wet. And you know, if you're doing it all the time and you're getting a lot of resistance, I think that's that's an indication that that something's wrong. That you need to start thinking about why there's so much compaction on your farm and what what you can do about it. Um, certainly, there are we do run into some situations that are are kind of chemical hard pans like the fragile pan down south. We get a little bit of that uh, here in Michigan uh, with some what they call a self cementing hard pan. Those are going to be de difficult to deal with. The alternative is what I would call biological sub subsoiling, using deep-rooted cover and cash crops in order to try to punch through some of those la layers. Uh, you know, the, the tillage-type radishes are certainly the ones we've thought of recently, these big daikons like you see in the lower picture. Other crops like sweet clover, annual ryegrass, also very good at penetrating deep into the soil. Uh, alfalfa, also very deeply tap-rooted, and if that can be in there for a couple of years, we may be okay. Of course, the flip side with alfalfa is we tend to create a lot of compaction by, uh, by running up and down uh, with big hay equipment. Uh, so, uh, And certainly getting organic uh, matter down uh, deeper into the profile is helpful. Your steel subsoiler doesn't do that at all. Your biological subsoiler certainly does. Um, equipment is very important to evaluate as you move to a lower tillage system. Uh, talked a little bit about the combines. You know, can you spread residue and chaff the full width of your header? Um, and if you can't, with your you know your your um, OEM equipment, maybe you need to think about something like the Redikoff Map Chopper. That's the rotor you see up there, uh, processing corn heads. You know, are we? Do we think about? maybe adding a camera to the back of the combine so we can mo monitor uh, how residue is going and certainly pay attention to wind direction and especially when you're using the grain table if if the wind direction is causing the residue to bunch up maybe you need to pivot that combine 90 degrees and go the other direction I'm not going to talk much about planting um, you know just a couple of thoughts first of all you know you you really have to pay attention to the maintenance when you go to a lower tillage system you cannot have uh, loose bushings and whatnot and have your row units wandering around back there you just won't get the kind of precision uh, you need to to really make it work well um, I think sometimes there's been a temptation to add more and more bells and whistles to try to, to to your planter, um, even uh, you know four carts and whatnot, to really kind of do a little tillage ahead of your your uh, planter. I I really encourage you to to simplify. You know a row cleaner, good coulter to open, good solidly maintained double disc openers, uh, seed rebounder to make sure you get that seed down in the trench. Uh, uh, closing wheel appropriate for your soils, whether that's uh, an iron, rubber, spiked, you know, mess around with it till you, you get what you need, talk to some neighbors, see what they're doing. And I don't think it hurts to have a drag chain back there. I mean, why not? Um, certainly some of the new technologies have been helpful. Uh, row, cr row clutches, I think, are great. Um, the ability to not overseed and to, to really precisely manage that stuff I think is, has been pretty awesome. Uh, there's also active down pressure systems now where it's only a, uh, applying as much down pressure as necessary to get the seed in the ground so we're not overdoing it when we don't need it. Um, big part of it really is getting off the tractor and looking. You know, Take that camera uh, off the combine, stick her on the planter so you can monitor what's going on behind you. Um, and you know every now and then you ought to get off the tractor dig up some rows look at what's going on um, we're, we really have entered into the age of data-driven farming uh, the yield monitor of course is critical uh, I encourage you to calibrate that thing a couple of times of the year make sure it's it's giving you good information there's a lot of emphasis these days on making sure you're not having a GIGO problem that is garbage in garbage out you know, if you're putting false data into your your uh, system, it's not going to give you uh, good answers to your problems. I think grid sampling is great. Uh, I'd like to see a fairly tight um, interval on that, under two acres if possible. Uh, electrical conductivity testing is another way to get a good solid grid and really know what 
the what the uh, fertility level is across the field. Uh, compaction sensors and and active down pressure systems are are big, and certainly the ability to map compaction can tell you where you maybe have some problems. Uh, crop sensors uh, near IR is a great way to evaluate crop health. Uh, soil moisture sensors are getting more common, where we're going to irrigate to uh, what we're detecting as opposed to just putting on a couple inches. And some systems are even uh, actively changing the uh, amount of water applied through center pivots as you go around the uh, as you go around the field a uh, couple of things on the horizon where you know we've got variable application of different things of nutrients uh, crop populations uh, we're starting to see some variable application of herbicides in response to uh, sensor readings maybe even varying the spray mix as we go across adding and subtracting components and we're certainly looking at a world where we may be able to plant two hybrids at the same time for offensive defensive management zones and you know what's next boy I you know you got me there's certainly a lot of interesting things that people are working on one question is you know do you need a data accountant like you need a tax accountant to keep up with all of this uh, drone aircraft are really uh, kind of on the on the verge of coming into more common use in ag after 2015. I expect once the rules are set up, we're going to see a lot more of these out there. You know, basically your smartphone has an autopilot in it. It's got all the different sensors it needs to fly an aircraft, and uh, a lot of our our drones basically are you know we can just tell them where to go. We don't have to have any special skills to fly them. Um, around the world, we're already seeing drone helicopters actually spraying and seeding. Um, we've actually seen in Japan, basically, manned helicopters have been squeezed right out of the market. And uh, like I said, these guys are going to come looking for you because the cops can only buy so many of these things. As far as uh, other sources of information, NRCS has made soil health a national priority. Uh, conservation districts are really working on this, uh, obviously. Uh, Michigan State Extension. Uh, the SARE, which is it has been the long-term federal project for sustainable agriculture, they've got some good information they've they've accumulated over the years. This No-Till Farmer magazine, I just love, and their website is also pretty awesome. And certainly, getting out and talking to your your neighbors who are doing the uh, who are already doing this is a good way to go. Uh, a lot of the no-tillers really like to share uh, what they've learned. Uh, Google's got a ton of information out there, and Google Scholar uh, is more academic papers. And even, you know, more mainstream publications like this Corn and Soybean Digest are, are really covering these issues more and more. So a lot of information out there. Uh, in Allegan, we run a thing called the Soil Health Working Group, uh, where we actually get together farmer to farmer and, and you know, talk to, talk to the farmers about how they do it. Uh, we do some questioning, and then we kind of walk and talk, look at equipment methods, and we always dig a soil pit. And we put it all up on YouTube, so if you're interested, uh, Smolligan Farm was, I guess, the one I'm most proud of. A real long-term no-till farm, and they certainly had some good in information for us. Uh, a lot of them have added vertical tillage tools, and these are real dedicated no-till guys, so I, that's one of the reasons I'm kind of geeked about this uh, vertical tillage. They really suggest you got to own the sprayer to be able to deal with weeds in a timely manner. Um, and they really emphasize that good planting starts with good harvesting, and that's why I really talk about about getting that residue out there even. That's just a shot of our YouTube channel. Um, you can go to the West Michigan Conservation and you'll find us. Uh, a couple of books to recommend. Uh, the one on the left is uh, from South America where no-till adoption is much higher. Uh, really, really just a wonderful book to read. Very almost poetic languages. And uh, the one on the right, what I've learned from no-till farming, that's a no-till farmer magazine profile of different no-tillers around the country. Um, I think when you're scouting, it's hard to beat uh, digging a soil pit, really having a look and seeing what's going on, uh, using a knife to pull up through the, the profile to check for compaction. And, you know, look at the worm pores, see how you're actually doing. Uh, I like to give it a little sniff, see if you can smell a little nitrogen there, see if you can smell that good earth smell. That's uh, kind of a sign that your, your uh, microbes are doing well. A slaking test is when we just drop a, a chunk of a soil aggregate right into uh, water, as you see, uh, on, a, on a piece of hardware cloth. 
if it looks like this when you're done where you know a little bit of soil crumbled off but it's not all dirty in there the soil's holding together that's a good sign a sign of soil health if it kind of explodes that's not healthy so kind of to wrap up you know if you want to make full progress on this stuff you want to think about continuous no-till continuous conservation tillage and beans are not enough you got to figure out how to grow corn um, cover crops are critical you know put the airplane up or, or hire out the neighbors if you can't get it done compaction management very critical balanced fertility I think is very helpful not only for crop quality but also to change the the nature of the soil you're up against I think narrow rows are going to be our future um, I think we'll see corn uh, continue to get squeezed tighter and tighter beans I think are are you know about where they need to be at those seven inch rows wheat we might want to think about three or four inch rows much more common in Europe and that's one of the ways they get to that uh, that 200 bushels optimum population uh, not only prison precision planting but with our small grains oftentimes we're planting by the bushel and not paying attention to the size of the seed I think that can lead to some over and under planting problems uh, weed management, uh, you know, resistant management, that's big. You know, Roundup is just not doing it like it used to. Uh, you know, resistance to steel, hand pulling, and mulch are holding steady. You know, I kind of highlight mulch because those first two are not that uh, popular anymore. But by having a good layer of mulch on the soil, we may be able to um, do a little better job of weed management. And certainly water management's helpful. Uh, having enough tile to get it done is good, but also being able to control it. And let's get away from this notion of tolerable soil loss. I just absolutely hate that not notion. Um, you know, not only is it uh, wasting your money to erode soil, we're robbing the future and we're inviting regulation. That's it for today. I'm you know I, if, if you were listening to this it's because we had technical problems and we couldn't get uh, me live uh, so uh, I hope we've uh, made the case today for uh, no-till or for conservation tillage and really hope uh, the rest of your day you uh, can pick up some good tips on how to get it done thanks for your attention today this is Mark Ludwig from the Elegant Conservation District